because somebody reminded me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's growth conversation on flatten the anxiety curve, leveraging your own emotions to help others. Today's presenters are Dr. Kelly Fazio and Dr. Rachel McLaren, who will introduce themselves shortly. At this time, I want to let you know that we will record the first portion of the call today so we can reach more people who aren't on the call. During the second half of the call, we will open it up for discussion and questions, and I'll turn off recording at that time. A quick reminder that this is an educational community-based session. It is not therapy and is intended to be a discussion that has takeaways we can learn from. On holdthedoor.com, you can find additional resources. Everyone will be muted and you can unmute yourself during the second half of the session. If you have any questions and wanna write them down, please use the chat function in Zoom and either send them publicly or to me directly. I'm the host, Jeff Hummel. Uh, we will read them during the second half of the discussion. Also, set your display to speaker view in the upper right-hand side of your screen so you can see the speaker nice and clear. So for those just joining us, welcome to the discussion. I will now turn it over to Dr. Rob Fazio. Rob? Thank you, Jeff. I have to apologize. I actually thought this was the NFL draft. My bad. Um, I, I, I'm really glad to see so many faces, familiar faces. And... Um, Tonight, we're gonna to talk a lot about helping others. One of the, the core philosophies of Hold the Doors is healing through helping others and, and tapping into ways that you can do that, um, getting outside yourself, even though we're all under so much stress. And delighted to have Dr. Kelly Fazio and Dr. Rachel McLaren. Uh, I'll talk about them a little bit more in, in a moment. Um, so for some of you, this might be your first one or it might be your third growth, growth conversation. We're, we're figuring this out with you and we're growing with you. So we're trying to figure out what the best cadence is one week, every two weeks, but we'll have different topics as, as we go. And there's some things that we hold true each and every time. Uh, I, I once had the opportunity of hearing one of Al Gore's speech writers, Dan Pink, uh, speak. And he said that the key to a good speech is levity, levity, brevity, and repetition. Levity, brevity, and repetition. So I, I, that always is in my mind of trying to repeat what we're learning so we're reinforcing and creating good habits. The, the first thing I'll let you know is I have a different setup, so that's why that click didn't work. That's definitely uh, someone else's fault, not mine. Uh, we always start with the strength at Hold the Door and what we wanna reinforce is we are all much stronger than we actually know. And sometimes we just need some reminders of that strength. And for those of you that recognize this, this is the George Washington Bridge. And on every 9-11, they hang a, an American flag. It's literally right between New York City and New Jersey. It's the most well-traveled bridge in the country. And for me, that's a good metaphor around the connectedness and how we're connected to one another as we get through this COVID-19 crisis. And I'll start with a, uh, with a strength in talking about people that I admire that have been around that are hold the door champions. So for example, we have Mrs. Sheehan on the line and, and, and she's been a fierce positive source for hold the door since we started uh, with getting the word out about growing through loss and adversity and just a strong person and when her husband passed away, we dedicated a hold the door year to her husband. Uh, and the whole philosophy and theme was around presence. And he was just someone growing up that was always there and always kind. And sometimes just acts like that help us be stronger. So just a, a reminder that strength doesn't have to be something that is so complicated. It could be as simple as that. Uh, we at Hold the Door are really focusing on during this crisis on flattening the anxiety curve. So we all, we know that the, the zigzag of anxiety, anxiety goes up, immune system goes down, doctor and hospital visits go up. So Hold the Door is trying to do our part to help out healthcare as well as individuals. And so there are things that we can do together. And the, the most simple thing that we put together is learn, laugh, love, every day spending 15 minutes doing one of these three things and creating a stockpile of positive experiences to combat all the negative emotions and experiences 
that will likely be confronting. Different than the acute crisis, this is a consistent one and one that's going to be going on for we're not sure how long it is. So taking some control and ownership back from the crisis is what we're trying to do. Uh, the, the, the other thing, I'm going to introduce our speakers in a moment. So Kelly, if you want to go ahead and um, start sharing your screen, you can. Uh, just a reminder on holdthedoor.com, you can see all of our resources that are downloadable with the self-awareness tool. Our, our advice to you is similar to what they do in the medical community, which is learn one, do one, teach one. Pick one of the resources such as optimism or humor or helping others, learn about it for yourself and then start putting it into practice and then teach it to someone else. And that will create a, uh, a cycle of um, a cycle of health and, and responsiveness. So let me stop sharing here. Okay. And uh, so tonight we have two um, great presenters. So uh, Dr. Kelly Fazio, I'm not very familiar with her work, but from what I heard, um, she does work with couples around communication. She's a professor at TCNJ. Um, and in particular, she studies couples during adverse time. She's also the, the head, along with Dr. Andy Hyde from Penn State, um, of our helper program, where when we have Hold the Door Day, it helps people learn helping skills. So applying our resources to help others. And then uh, Dr. Rachel McLaren. So uh, Rachel is at University of Iowa in communication studies. She is the director of the undergraduate program, and she studies the intersection between communication, emotion, and cognition. So how our thoughts, feelings interact, and in the way that you can communicate effectively. I'm a big fan of her research, but what's more important to me about Rachel is she's someone that is, um, sorry, such an important part of our communities. When, when you think about your daughter and who you want her to look up to, um, Rachel is that person, so I'll turn it over. Oh. Wow, thanks, Rob. That was so sweet. Uh, Kel, hi. Hi, everyone. I didn't know we'd be able to see you. I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm Rachel McLaren, coming to you from Iowa. Uh, and Kel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everybody. I am Kelly Fazio, coming to you from New Jersey. Um, and I'm just excited to get to collaborate with Rachel on this. She's a great friend. We were, you know, uh, graduate students together and then colleagues together at Iowa before I moved back home. So it's fun to get to reconnect in this way again. Great. So <clears throat> in thinking um, about what we wanted to share with you today, I think we have so much that we would love to share with you. We're going to try to be concise. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, so I'm also a fast talker, so I'm confident we'll be able to, to share with you as much as we can during our time together today. So uh, I study emotions, and you may be as surprised as I was to learn that um, when this whole pandemic started, that I was really, I was really feeling a lot of emotions, and I was really struggling to understand what those emotions were. Um, and I think I kind of misidentified some emotions initially that I was feeling. Um, and so I want to share with you a little bit about sort of some of that story, but also what we know in emotion research about, about our own emotions, about what they're telling us, and then what, what they're motivating us to do. So kind of what we're going to take you through today is to be able to talk about not only understanding ourselves first. I think that's a really big, important part. What are we feeling? Who are we as people? And how can that come through and be able to allow us to connect with others in the world, to be able to help others to share our gifts? I know my brother Trevor is on this call. Um, and early on in the pandemic, I remember calling him and saying, you know, I'm just crying all the time. And I haven't cried in months. I'm not a person that normally cries a lot, but I'm, you know, littlest things. And I'm we have three children at my house. My husband and I both work, so we're trying to manage, you know, homeschooling and parenting and all of that. So I'd end up uh, during my work time in my office just sitting at my desk crying. Uh, and I really thought what I felt was fear. And I think we do, there's a lot of collective fear going on right now. Um, but the first emotion that I have on this slide is actually grief. 
because at least for me, and that was the thing that I didn't identify, um, a lot of my sadness, I think, wasn't just based on fear, was, but was based on grief. And it was a conversation with my brother that actually was the aha moment to be like, oh, wow, I didn't connect with that. Um, no one that I know has died of COVID-19, so it wasn't grief from a loss of a loved one, although certainly people might be experiencing that now as well. But it was really grief um, coming from all the other kinds of loss we're experiencing right now, right? So um, grief comes from that loss. It could be loss of identity. It could be you know, loss of a job, loss of a routine. Um, I know I feel like I lost all my coping mechanisms, like my typical things that I go out in the world to, um, to do and cope with those things, a loss of normalcy, right? We can also be feeling grief around anticipatory grief. So that worry that we are, we are going to lose things, right? That's something um, that there's more grief that's coming. So all, um, so I'm going to go through this first top part and just talk about where these emotions come from, what appraisals that they come from. Uh, the second one that I think a lot of people feel are feeling right now is fear. And fear comes from the judgment. Rob was talking about cognitions, right? That cognition or judgment of the environment that something bad could happen, right? So fear comes with that uncertainty. I don't know for sure what's going to happen, but it could be bad. And there's a lot of different fears that we have, right? So fear... How is this gonna affect my job if I still have one? Um, is someone I know or love gonna get sick? If they get sick, are they gonna be okay? Um, being afraid, you know, there's all different levels of that fear. So there's, it's really closely coupled with um, uncertainty. Uh, some of you might be feeling angry uh, these days, or maybe you've seen people expressing anger. And anger comes, or frustration, comes from when we feel like something is interfering with a goal that we have. So I might just wanna you know, live my life normally, but this is going on and I'm frustrated, right? I, and I don't even know who to direct that frustration at. Um, Kelly, I think you have an example of some anger that you've seen recently. Yeah, and I know I think we've all probably seen it through social media, but I think that there's a you know, very real need to feel like you can protect your loved ones and the communities you love right now. And when people are seeing things that are compromising that ability to protect our loved ones, like people congregating in communities and basketball courts and kids playing too close together and not kind of respecting that social distance guideline that we have, um, people are, are really angry about it. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's coming from a space of, of wanting to fix it, wanting to correct it. Um, and it's good intentions, but it's a difficult emotion to manage when you can't do anything about it in the moment. And that's what this particular experience is doing to us. Yeah. And so then that anger might get directed at people that aren't responsible for that, right? Um, my husband the other day said, you know, you just seem really annoyed. And I was like, I am annoyed. I'm annoyed at everything right now. I'm annoyed at the situation. I'm annoyed that we're stuck in the house. You know, there's just, there's a lot of, a lot of that floating around. Um, but there's also positive emotions that many of you might be feeling during this time as well. Uh, maybe you felt gratitude at different times. That gratitude might be for uh, the healthcare workers, for the people in grocery stores, you know, that are helping to keep us fed and take care of us. It might be gratitude um, for having a home, for having, you know, any of those kinds of things where you feel that happiness from appreciation for the things that we do have. And what I want to say about these emotions is just, um, one, I think we're all riding the ups and downs, right? Some days things go really well. Other days we might feel like we're, you know, uh, in the closet crying. I have a big closet, but sometimes I have hidden in the closet and called Kelly when I needed to. Um, and so, you know, there, there's those ups and downs. And just because we might have a lot of things that we feel grateful for doesn't mean also that we can't feel sadness. It doesn't mean to say, you know, we don't need to do comparative suffering to say, well, this person has it worse. So I have no right to feel the feelings that I'm feeling. I always tell my students, feelings are facts. Um, they are, right? I can't talk you out of how you're feeling or I really shouldn't ethically. That's, that's how you feel. So when we feel those different emotions, they're associated with action tendencies or things that they propel us to want to do. Grief is a little unique in that we all deal with grief differently. Um, and you're probably very familiar with the stages of grief. Um, but I don't know if you know, David Kessler just came out with a new book about the sixth stage of grief, which he says is meaning making. And I think that, you know, this, this whole situation will present an opportunity to try to come up with some meaning at the end of this. Maybe some of you are um, processing through some of that now to figure out what, what does this all mean? What can we learn from this? 
With fear, what fear makes us want to do, if something bad could happen, it makes us want to protect, right? So something bad could happen. I want to protect myself against that threat. And you've probably heard of fight or flight. Um, there's also freeze in there too, which are all ways that we might react to fear. So I'm going to, um, and I think control is part of this too, at least for me, is like calling everyone I love and saying like, what are you doing? And are you staying home? And, you know, trying to um, protect everyone. Like we want to control that. And there's a lot that we can't control right now, which can be really hard to accept. Anger makes us want to attack. And that might be verbally, right? That might be, oh, I just have so much anger about the situation, about what's happening, um, about how other people are acting or whatever it is. And so know that that's a normal tendency, not necessarily very pro-social all the time, depending on who your anger is directed at, right? And then gratitude, positive emotions can help us broaden and build. Um, negative ones really get us very focused on a small thing and like really targeted. And when we're feeling good, when we're feeling grateful for things, right? We have that ability to think more broadly, to think creatively, maybe about how we can share our kindness uh, with others or share our appreciation um, when we're feeling gratitude for those people, which really helps us to build our own skills and resources as we go forward, right? We're, we're seeing so much creativity right now uh, in ways that people are connecting, in ways that people are figuring out how to share their gifts. And I think um, that it makes for a really interesting time. So I think part of this sort of self-study that's going to help us to help others. Also, um, what I'm realizing right now is that many people I'm talking to are feeling extremely exhausted. I think that our, um, we're on sort of high alert and we're really, uh, it's causing a lot of exhaustion. And so for me, I had to kind of sit down just a couple of weeks ago and say, okay, if I'm not keeping myself at a certain level of um, functioning, then I'm really not going to be any good to anyone else around me. And so maybe many of you have, are already on this journey of like figuring out what are those things that make you your best self, uh, that are sort of your non-negotiables here, um, the things that you need to do every day in order to be the best version of yourself. But if you haven't done that, this might be a really good time and sort of a good experiment to see what are those things that you need every day that are going to help you to fill up your tank enough um, or at least a little bit and so for me i wrote 10 things out that just said like these are what i'm going to focus on every day and they're really simple you know it's um, meditation movement um, making sure i do something to feel productive right uh, affection um what else do i have on there creativity something creative right getting outdoors so that can be something that you can reflect on as well, because we all know we can't pour from an empty cup, right? There's lots of metaphors about putting on your own oxygen mask before helping someone else. Um, and so being able to identify your emotions when you name them, right, then you can um, better move through them after you identify them. And then also we have here with what your blueprint is, like what are those things and how can you prioritize those things, even if you know time is constricted, even if it's just a couple of minutes that you have to get outside and smell the fresh air or do some jumping jacks with your kids or what, whatever those things are for you that are your sort of non-negotiables. Yeah, and I think the, the non-negotiables tie in quite a bit with the different roles that we play, right? So what hats do we wear? Um, and we often identify ourselves through these roles. So we have things like, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher. We have these, you know, these ideas of how we move through space. And in addition to those roles, we have identities attached to them. So I wanna be a helper. I wanna be perceived as competent. I wanna be patient and productive. Um, and these are all things that right now can feel really challenging to us because of the circumstances that we're in. So if you think about what COVID-19 is doing, it's shifting the landscape here, right? It's really um, disruptive in terms of some of the identities and some of the roles that we play. So, you know, right now I am a work from home 
um, mom that does not have daycare, right? And how does that affect how I am a working um, individual, a working woman and, and a mother um, in terms of how I used to function separately in them? They're kind of merged together. Um, we're operating in scarce resources, right? It might be that, you know, there's a lot more people under one roof all the time right now. We might have a not enough internet capacity, not enough food, right? Different families are dealing with different scarce resources. Um, and we don't have a precedent for this. So a lot of times when we are feeling comforted um, or we're trying to find resolutions to different things, we have a precedent to reflect back on. And this is just something that we have not dealt with before. I don't think any of us could fully imagine how our lives were going to change a month from, you know, a month ago. Um, so these are things to, to remember that when you're in these circumstances, your toolbox doesn't have all the same tools in it. And you really need to become creative about ways to um, think about how you think about yourself, how you keep that self-esteem up so that you can then leverage those different emotions and those feelings in ways that are gonna be productive for you to then extend outward. Um, part of these transitions and disruption, I mean, I have an example last night I shared briefly in the beginning, I was supposed to teach a night class starting at 530. Um, and Rob and I had a conflict, right? So I had my daughter with me, who's usually really easy going when it comes to us having to kind of give her an activity so we could manage some of those, um, some of those work from home um, newness that we're dealing with. And she just was over it. Um, and she had a really epic toddler meltdown like I hadn't seen before and it was like 522 and I'm like I've got this I'm going to work on this I'm going to practice my patience this is going to be <laughs> uh, a really you know something that we're going to reflect back on and, and learn from and it was like 525 and it was getting worse and it was like 527 and I was starting to curse in my head um, 528 529 get just worse and worse I could not console her and I'm thinking I'm going to sign on to a zoom call much like this because this is how we're teaching now and I am going to you know my identities were going through my head I'm going to look like a bad mom I'm gonna look like a bad teacher they're gonna feel like I'm not respecting their time which is important to me for them to realize that I know they have stressors at their homes too um, they're gonna think I'm disorganized all of these things were going through my head um, and I sign on and she is crying in my arms and I say I'm gonna need you all to just get started without me for a few minutes. And they showed me grace. They just started without me. They smiled, they gave me compassionate looks. Um, and I muted myself, or I thought I did. I later found out I had not muted myself. And I went to the side and talked to Reese and I heard them starting class together. Um, and it struck me in that moment more than it ever had that in times like this, especially when our identities are colliding together and we don't have the same toolkits like space and quiet, um, it's not about being professional, it's about being collaborative, right? And it's about how you can, as a community, rise up together um, and show each other grace and compassion. And it was a really beautiful moment after that. It took me about 10 minutes to calm down and be able to focus again and for you know me to feel good that she was comfortable and they were good and we had a great class. And I think that um, it speaks to some opportunities and silver linings in here, but it doesn't mean that you get there without the stress that you know we're talking about right now and how your emotions can really um, can really impact those experiences for you. So part of those transitions, um, it, it's really fueled by uncertainty. And we know from research that uncertainty causes um, a, a lot of stress. It can really impact your ability to communicate clearly, both in terms of how you're interpreting other people sending messages to you and then how you're creating messages outward. Um, you have heightened emotions and it's impacting the dialogue that you're having and your ability to uh, you know, kind of see uh, or plan out in normal ways or strategize in ways because we don't have answers. So it's functioning in the space where you are um, having to be kind of comfortable in this chronic um, ambiguity in some ways. When you're in these situations, in uncertain times, whether it's relationally or in, in the world like we're dealing with now, 
it's natural for you to have more conflict, right? Because you're experiencing all these emotions, because you're dealing with um, constant uh, uncertainty of some sort, it really makes sense that you are going to have mo uh, moments that are uh, when you're not at your best and maybe when your loved ones are not at their best, right? And it's funny because Rachel and I, you know, we studied this in grad school so closely and we still have to remind ourselves sometimes that when transitions are happening, it's really common for uncertainty to happen. And when uncertainty happens, you need to rely on other people to um, kind of renegotiate how you're behaving and moving through space. And with that brings stressors as well. So one thing we have to do is kind of normalize that in stressful situations, it's going to feel um, difficult individually, difficult in our relationships, and really difficult in terms of how we're functioning in space in general. One thing we know is that with that conflict comes emotional flooding. So Rachel talked about a lot of these emotions and how they link to different behaviors and how we, you know, kind of act. When we're feeling mad, we feel the, you know, the need to attack. When you are emotionally flooded in a conflict, when you start feeling physiological reactions, like your heart racing, you're sweating a little bit, you can kind of feel yourself getting hot. These are all indicators that you are experiencing what we're calling emotional flooding. Um, and that means that you are not going to be communicating in clear or thoughtful ways, right? Um, and that's gonna get nobody anywhere. Um, so, you know, research shows you need at minimum 20 minutes. So if you need to take a walk, if you need to work out, if you need to do something, say you're coming back, but go and do those things because they're, it's really important for productive conversations to not be fueled by the emotions that you're feeling in that moment. Um, I tell my students all the time, you know, you're going to hear these old wives tales, go to bed, you know, don't go to bed angry, don't go to bed angry. I say go to bed angry. If you wake up in the morning and it's still bothering you, have it out. By all means, talk it out, have the argument, do what you need to do. Um, but if you wake up in the morning and it's not that big of a deal, you almost forgot about it, you just probably saved yourselves like two hours of this long drawn out conversation that just made you more angry than helpful. So thinking about how, what state of mind you're in and that we are all under stress right now. Children you know friends spouses parents and showing each other kind of kind of grace in that moment and giving ourselves that space is something that can be really helpful I had muted myself sorry um, so I think all of this gives us a chance to recalibrate and recalibrate with the people in our um, in our lives Kelly was just giving examples about families. I think, you know, one thing my husband and I have tried to do, and I think you could do with anyone that you're working closely with during this time, whether they be employees or, um, you know, people that are part of your team, people that are part of your family, is to try to say, what went well today? What worked? Because it's constantly moving, at least here. What didn't go well? What can we try differently tomorrow? Um, it gives you a chance to kind of celebrate those wins, reflect on the lessons that are, it's really hard earned wisdom right now, like learning those things, um, learning what we can do, and then trying to, to recalibrate, to adjust, right? We have to kind of work our way through this. I've observed that I think each of my, each week, someone has a meltdown. It's like they're weak to melt down. Uh, and so then we need, like we're, this week, it's my three-year-old's week to melt down apparently. So um, how can we recalibrate, right? What does she need? And this is also, Brene Brown talked about in a recent podcast, um, this idea of a family gap plan. Is that what it was, Cal? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I couldn't remember if that was the exact term. Times when we um, are not functioning at 100%. So she talks about the myth of 50-50, that in you know, um, partnerships, a lot of times it's not that each person is giving 50%. At one point, maybe somebody's giving 80 and another person's giving 20. And then at another time, another person's giving 60, another person's giving 40. That we're, as long as we're kind of adding up to 100% of what needs to get done, then we're probably doing okay. Um, you could see where if everyone's operating at a depleted level, and again, this might be in teams that you're working with, um, in many different situations, right? Not just families, then what are we gonna do with that gap that we have between 100% functioning and where we are right now? Um, I think the first thing we can do is lower our standards and just ex like right now say, okay, we can't expect in a pandemic that we're gonna be as productive as we usually are, right? We might've had high hopes of doing all these house projects or getting all these extra things done. Um, and so the family gap plan is like when there's a gap, what are we gonna do when there's a gap between 100% functioning and where we both are, where we are as a family, what are we gonna do to get us back functioning well? Um, and sometimes it's basic things, right? It might be 
worth having that conversation with your family about what's needed. How can we kind of reset and replenish people? Um, some people might need that time alone. Some people might need more extroverted time, more sleep. Um, we've been doing a lot of baking in my house, which is good, but like eating a lot of cookies doesn't make me feel better in the end. So, you know, healthy foods, whatever it is for, for your family. So I thought that was a really helpful concept um, to acknowledge that sometimes we can just say, hey, I'm, I'm functioning at 40% today. I'm not at 100. I'm just going to put that out there and then see what we can do with that. And, you know, another one of our favorite authors, uh, Glennon Doyle, if any of you are reading her new book, Untamed, kind of gave this metaphor in her book about this idea of a flight attendant. Like she was talking in reference to her children, but it, it extends beyond that. And it's this idea that like when there's turbulence or when something goes wrong on a, on a plane, who are you looking at? And I do this. I look to the flight attendant because if she looks like things are fine or if he looks like things are fine, I feel much better. If I feel like I'm interpreting a little bit of something on their face that's not good, I start to feel nervous, right? So she used this idea of like, people look to you and if you are showing calm, they might mirror what you're going to mirror, right? So your reaction becomes their reaction. Um, and that's helpful. And Rob talks quite a bit about this in, in terms of anxiety, that this anxiety is contagious. So COVID's contagious, right now anxiety is contagious. Um, and and there's, there's truth to that. And I, I think we can also think about it in terms of calm can be contagious and compassion can be contagious as well, right? Um, we can definitely mirror one another in that way. Um, but how do we get there? So we're talking about these kind of your close circle, because if those situations aren't, um, if aren't feeding you or fueling you, it's really hard to look outward after this, right? So we're kind of acknowledging that as we move now into helping others. Um, and, you know, one thing Rachel and I talked about is like, it's one thing, it's a lot of pressure to say, you know, you might not be feeling calm, but if people are looking to you, you need to show calm. Um, how do we do that if that's something we wanna do? And it made us kind of think further, like, well, they're probably, you know, whoever's work, whatever situation we're in, there's a behind the scenes, right? So in keeping with this metaphor, like who's in your galley, who's in the back, you know, pep talking you, um, you know, when you are crying, you know, in your bedroom for a second, what friend are you calling? Who are your lifelines so that you can reconnect to those ideas identities um, and to those people that remind you who you are and what you're good at and what you need to be able to outwardly put those things out. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, we can kind of think of as we as we turn to uh, these next two slides that'll help us talk a little bit more through how we can now outwardly help each other. Yeah. So <clears throat> We've gotten our understanding of our own emotions, um, thought about what we need to fill us up, identity analysis, and thought about um, who we want to show calm for and who's in our galley. Uh, when we're thinking about reaching out to others, we might be limited right now in the ways that we can reach out given um, physical distancing. And so one thing that I, I think is great to remember is that you can't fix this. You can't fix the pandemic. You can't get the person their job back. You can't fix the economy. Like you can't fix this problem. Um, there might be small things that you can do absolutely to help in a certain person's situation. But a lot of times what gives us, what makes us feel good as recipients is that co-presence, right? Knowing that we're not alone. Even just calling Kelly and talking to her when I'm having a hard time, right? She's not gonna make the situation itself different, but she makes the fact that I'm not alone um, that, that makes me feel a lot better, right? So when we can reach out to others, co-presence virtually, um, probably in this situation, remember that listening is powerful. Listening speaks volumes. Uh, and I always say that the best advice for advice givers is not to give advice um, because people don't, don't aren't, you know, it, it's not really helpful unless it's asked. If you really can't help yourself, say, um, if you would like some advice, I have some ideas for you right? But then let them ask you about that. Uh, avoid comparisons like, oh, it could be so much worse, right? I think I've uh, slipped and said things that, like that to my kids before. Like, I know you're sad about school being canceled, but it could be so much worse. It's really invalidating for people to, to hear that, right? And also for those people, that might be the biggest loss that they have experienced. And just knowing that someone else has gone through a different loss, um, doesn't make it feel less to them, right? It doesn't feel good to have those comparisons. And it's fine if a person wants to turn to the silver lining, but uh, my other thing that I really try to avoid saying is any sentences that start with at least, right? Well, at least you still have your job. I hear you that it's hard working from home, but at least you still have your job. At least blah, blah, blah. At least you're still healthy. 
Um, yes, those things might be true, but as a listener, as a person offering support, um, you can wait for that person to turn towards the door of hope or turn, turn towards more optimistic thinking, uh, but you don't want to shove them through that door before they're ready and kind of force them to look at the bright side, right? Because that can be very disconfirming to the current emotions that we're feeling. If I called Kelly or my brother and said, I'm so sad, and they said, ah, buck up. There's nothing to be sad about. The sun's shining, right? Well, that might be true, but that's not helpful right now. I'm looking for that connection. I'm looking for someone to see and um, and, and empathize maybe with my emotions, express that compassion. In terms of concrete actions, I think um, Glennon Doyle talks about this as well, turning your heartbreak into action. What are the things that, that break your heart right now? Where are there stories that you're reading about or things that you're hearing about that um, are, are heartbreaking to you in a way that, that pulls you towards them, right? That makes you think, oh, I, I feel for that person. I want to do something for that person or for that community. And I think focus on that. That's so telling for what you care about. And I think um, that's where you're going to be most effective, right? Know that if you feel that pull from your heartbreak, from whatever it is that you're feeling, find, you know, follow that and use that to turn that into action. Um, and you're really only limited by your creativity at this point to figure out how to do that, right? How to get involved. And we're seeing so many amazing stories and examples. Um, support menu we have here as well. Uh, a lot of times when people are going through difficulties, we say to them, let me know if I can do anything, right? Um, when a person's going through a really hard time, a lot of times they don't know what they need. And so it can be very helpful for us to be able to say specifically, here's what I can offer you right now. Hey, I'm going to Costco. Do you want to split a pack of toilet paper, <laughs> right? I, I'm happy to drop off half at your house. Um, do you want me to, you know, and this, and this example here, do you want me to text you a joke a day, quality to be determined? Uh, make a specific offer to that person of something that you feel that you could do and you would like to do, something that's in line with your gifts, because you don't need to do everything and you don't need to be good at everything, right? And we want to avoid getting ourselves into a situation where we say, hey, let me know if I can do anything. And then someone says, um, can you go grocery shopping for me? And you think, well, I didn't want to do that, but now I just, you know, and then we end up being resentful. So you want to pick something that you um, do feel like you can do, right? And then be really specific about those offers to others. Um, and then, you know, some, the last kind of three ways we've talked through, um, Adam Grant um, borrowed a term from another thought leader named Adam Rifkin about this five minute favor, right? So what can you do to help other people and how can you create a community of kind of gratitude and giving back? And this idea of the five minute favor is that you carve out five minutes in your day to try to make a difference in somebody else's life. And you do this every day. This could be connecting somebody, right? Network support. I know this person who just went through this um, and I can connect you together to them. Um, it could be that you're offering feedback. I'm part of a group of six women um, who we just regularly connect. It started off professionally and, you know, we have other connections like we're all moms to little girls and we talk through that and we are um, there for each other in terms of, you know, as we transition jobs or ideas, or our kids are going through turning points as sounding boards to one another. Um, and that's turned into a really incredible and, and easy resource to create. It was something that just happened really organically and we really hold, uh, you know, hold it in, in high regard because of that. Um, you can also endorse somebody. So, you know, we're home right now. And a lot of times, you know, if you're on this call and you're a helper, you're feeling really like, you know, your hands are just tied and there's not the normal ways that you can help people. And it can be a really frustrating experience. If you have, you know, visited a doctor's office or if you have a loved one that is coping um, with health issues right now and you had a doctor or a nurse or um, somebody, you know, an aide in the office that made your visit different, go online and write a review you for them, right? It do something to kind of give that back and to say thank you. That is going to lift them up and, you know, and help them in other ways. Um, and, and these are kind of these small things that, that we can do. Um, in terms of, you know, COVID related, you know, uh, I have so many desserts in my house from my mother and my mother-in-law that it could last me months, right? This is their love language. They love to feed and send food and they know that I have a sweet tooth. And this every single box of milk duds and slices of cake that get dropped off or sent are things that um, really make me feel the love when I can't physically be with them, right? 
what can you do? What are other people's um, you know, love languages? How can you send them um, and adjust in, in this type of environment? But I did not expect to quote my husband quite this much in this talk, but he has you know, really taught me something in terms of this idea about, you can do these five minute favors, but there's also, there has to be a marathon mentality. And when there's a difference between a pick me up you know, uh, gesture of support and uh, somebody is going through something really hard and life-changing and, and complicated. Um, and in those moments, you need to think outward. It's everybody's gonna leave after those initial stages of closure and grief that we have, you know, have in society. Um, but, you know, what are the special moments in that person's life? And can you continue to show up for them, right? It might be that you remember a birthday of a loved one that they've lost or a special tradition they used to do and find a way, even if you have to write it in your calendar year after year, so you remember that date, you know, because that's important to them to make sure that you're reaching out in those moments. So do these short term quick things, but think about ways to be there when everybody else starts to get back to normal because their lives are not going to be back to normal ever again or in the same way again. Um, and then he also talks about, Adam Grant, not my husband, also talks about um, calling on helper consultants, right? Or I kind of called them that. Enlist the help of other people. So there's a lot of helpers out there and it might be a, a feature of just having others help you do the work. When you are naturally helping, you can feel overburdened. And Rachel mentioned this idea of resentment. So teach other people to be helpers. Right now in our town, there are rainbows on so many windows when you walk by to show support for, um, you know, just the stay at home movement, the gratitude for essential workers and healthcare workers. Um, these are things we can teach lessons for from young ages all the way up. And part of this might just be saying, you know, you're really good at this. Can you help me out? And that's something I've learned as a teacher. Um, I think the student's actually on the call today, but I had um, a really special student and, you know, she was in my office one day talking to me about, you know, next steps and things like that. And it just struck me um, that I've thought something about her for a really long time and I hadn't ever said it out loud. So I said it to her, you know, you're really good at this. I think you need to be in a situation where you can do this. Um, and it was a, a learning moment for me because it came back later that that was something that you know, she kind of calls on or remembers being told. Um, and I now do that all the time. So in that lesson, you know, I learned a lesson back because that's how you, you know, help people realize what others see of them in ways that they can continue to help others. So um, that's something that you can do as a really kind of subtle gesture to help people recognize the roles they can play. And then finally, create community connections, right? So there's a lot of research that shows that if you wanna build community resilience, so this is kind of that ecological level or the big, the big global level um, in your town, in your state, whatever it might be, um, it's really about having this collective identity. So COVID presents you know, a situation where this can get called into action. Um, this idea that we can't, we can't move out of this unless we work together. This is our problem, it's our stressor, and here is our solution and that there is potential to really grow community resilience in terms of when stressors come up in the future we found ways to cope together to make this better my community i mentioned this on a, on a call um one of the i think the first time um somebody got a list of all the healthcare workers in our town and it was a growing list and went in social media and people could donate 15 dollars to send a pizza to their houses thank you and that did two things it increased morale um, and it also supported small businesses at the same time. Um, so social media really leverages us or gives us the ability to, um, you know, find bigger ways to mobilize people to make a change. And as Rachel said, it's really just about what is pulling at your heartstrings and how can you be creative in doing that. So we're going to stop there. Um, last thing, these little cards are actually one example of a five minute favor you can do. The cards in the last two slides, I put the, um, the website at the bottom here, but it's Adam Grant's and Cheryl Sandberg's option B. They updated some of their materials to be COVID specific, and you can just click on one of these cards and get it sent as a text, I believe, or an email directly to somebody. So these are nice little gestures that we thought were really helpful um, in terms of quick ways that you can let people know you're thinking of them right now. All right, Thank I'm going to stop sharing. So. Thank you, Kelly and Rachel. Uh, Rachel, at least I have some advice for you, just a little bit. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was great and really helpful. Um, 
And now we would like to open up for, for questions for, for Rachel and Kelly. Um, and we're going to turn off the recording and we're going to turn off Facebook Live now. So this is just a conversation.